Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is Christmas week if you celebrate. Hope you are having a wonderful week. Maybe you're off of work. Maybe you have kids and they're off of school. I don't know, but uh, I hope that you are having a wonderful week. Uh, My week is going okay so far. I keep forgetting what day it is. <laughs> it's Tuesday, right? It's the 21st. Yes. Thankfully, that information is on my phone and I can look and make sure that I am not getting my days mixed up. Speaking of getting mixed up, um, well, the first part is not about getting mixed up. The first part is that at the end of the last episode, I said that on this episode, I would be speaking with Matthew Fitzsimmons about his novel, Constance. And that was supposed to happen. But unfortunately, he had something come up this weekend and needed to reschedule his interview. So no problem. We are in the process of rescheduling that. I had two interviews this weekend. So the episode that was originally going to post on Friday now gets moved up to today. And I am speaking with Mark. Marco Karokari, Karokari, he said it, listen when he says his name in the interview, I apologize, Uh, uh, C-A-R-O-C-A-R-I, about his debut novel, it's called Blackout, and here's where the confusion part comes in, because I was just saying I'm confused about what day it is, but also I was just thinking as I was preparing to put this uh, publish this episode that I had two interviews last weekend that were scheduled so I was um, reading two books last week Constance and Blackout I have two interviews coming up this weekend on Sunday so I'm reading two books for this weekend and I'm also listening to audiobooks when I am usually when I am working on other things that I don't need my not my full attention, that's not exactly what I mean, but you know, if, if I'm typing something, I can't listen to an audiobook, but if I'm doing something that I can listen to an audiobook and still do the work that I have, then I'll be listening to an audiobook. And so often I have several books going at once, uh, several interviews happening uh, around those books, and I'm just wondering if you are a person who reads multiple books at once or does anything like this. Do you ever get them confused? Because I'm just afraid that one of these times I'm actually going to start talking about a book that is the wrong book for the interview that I'm doing or the episode that I'm doing. I don't know. Or that I'm just going to be completely confused and have this whole plot line that's made up of really four different books that I'd read in the last week or couple of weeks. I don't know. You ever have that issue? Let's, uh, Let's talk about Blackout. Blackout, as I said, is Marco's debut novel. Here is the description from the back of the book. Straight-laced, 40-something Franco definitely picked the wrong night to get freaky. A hookup with a hot guy on his Manhattan rooftop and a joint he's unaware is laced leaves him dazed. And if memory serves him, the sole witness to a murder across the street. Except the cops can't find a crime scene or a body, and Franco's perforated recollections and conflicting testimony leave the detectives unimpressed. When when days later the mutilated body of a philanthropic millionaire is discovered, he's not only shocked to learn he knew him, but with Franco's fingerprints all over the crime scene, he quickly graduates from unreliable witness to prime suspect. And the random trick who could alibi him, has vanished into the anonymity of the internet. Unsettled and confronted with 40-year-old memories when Franco's father was murdered in front of him during during Manhattan's infamous blackout, a shocking revelation finally unmasks the man who pulled the trigger that night and painting Franco the perfect suspect. With a target on his back and time running out, the truth will set Franco free or earn him a toe tag at the morgue. 
no, not really uh, great choices there. <laughs> the first one, good, setting you free, not so much ending up in the morgue, but that is the description of Blackout. The first scene is 1977, right before the blackout, when Franco is four and he witnesses his father's murder, and then it jumps to present day, and there's some back and forth, obviously, as he is, you know, obviously he's still traumatized by witnessing his father's murder, but then there's some back and forth. The murder hasn't been solved, and now he's embroiled in this mess where he is convinced that he saw, that he witnessed a murder, but he's again an unreliable or an unreliable witness compared to the rest of his life when he is very it says straight laced he's he's very much on the straight and narrow you know he doesn't he doesn't drink that much he never does drugs and of course the one time he does anything he uh he ends up he ends up in this situation anybody french kiss fans out there the movie french kiss with meg ryan and kevin klein where she says it's like that one time in my life when i smoked pot <laughs> well this is the one time in his life uh, i don't think it's the one time but it's it's a time in his life when he smokes pot and it is not it does not go well at any rate let's go ahead and turn to the interview with marco so he can talk more about this book again it is called blackout marco welcome to the podcast Thank you. And um, thank you, Sarah. And I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. We're going to talk about your debut novel, Blackout. But before we get to that novel, if you could start by just sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. All right. Well, I am a Swiss native who is now living in America. Uh, I'm in Palm Springs and uh, I was born 53, almost 54 years ago and uh, started life as a shop assistant, uh, worked for the airlines for 13 years for Swiss Air way back when, um, became a full-time photographer. And that is basically how I've made my money in the last few years, how I spent my time. And then the writing came about eight years ago. And now I live in the States with my husband in Palm Springs. So I've never been to Switzerland, but how big of a culture adjustment was Switzerland to Southern California? <laughs> uh, well, there was a little bit of it um, because of the flying, I guess. Uh, I used to come here quite a bit uh, in my 20s and 30s already. So I, I knew what to expect in California. But then, of course, it's always uh, quite a different story living here as opposed to vacationing. So it was a bit of an adjustment. And of course, in Palm Springs, we don't really get a whole lot of seasons as opposed to uh, most of Europe, where you have your typical spring, summer, fall, winter. And here it's basically summer, summer, or hot, hotter and hotter. And then it gets a little cooler just around now, uh, November, December, January. But uh, it's I love it here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm glad that things are starting to open up again, again so that you can actually travel. I went to see my family earlier this year after not seeing them for a year and a half in person. And that was really nice. So you get to every now and again, explore different parts of the country and maybe get a little bit more seasons for, you know, someone who's used to them. Other than that, I have to say, I, I love California. I love being here. That's great. I, I miss sweaters. I mean, I don't really miss winter, but I miss layers. <laughs> Yeah, that's the nice thing here that now that it's a little colder is uh, the right time to kind of change your wardrobe a bit. And, you know, honestly, it's actually kind of surprising and people are laughing at me. I'm from Switzerland. I am used to cooler temperatures. Our summers generally are in the 90s if we're lucky. And, you know, the rest of the year is fairly cold. Now I live in Palm Springs. And if it goes below 60, I'm like, this is too cold. I need to, I need to go somewhere more tropical, which is really kind of strange. It shouldn't be that way for someone who's basically used to bet the two more. You, you and my husband would get along just fine. He jokes that he won't leave the house if it's under 50. <laughs> and, and he grew up with winter also. So yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about the book again. It's called Blackout. Can you give an overview of the story? Yes. Um, Blackout is the story of 43 year old photographer, Franco DiMazzo, who lives in New York. He uh, picks the wrong night to break out of his comfort zone and get freaky a little. And unfortunately, it's the night he is not only high on drugs, which is very unusual for him, but he also witnesses a murder across the street. Of course, by the time the cops show up, there is no crime scene, no body. It's 
it's not quite clear if what he saw is what he actually saw. And um, as time progresses, the police will find a body. And of course, he goes from very unreliable uh, witness to prime suspect. And uh, especially when it, when it turns out that everything he witnessed, everything he saw that's been happening the last few days is connected to the 40-year-old murder of his father, which happened when he was just four years old, right before the New York City blackout hit. So he has a bit of a blackout today because he can't remember about an hour and it's connected to the blackout in 77 in New York, hence the title. Yeah, and I, and I, I also noticed that there's a lot of times in the book when there's a new chapter or a transition of some sort, there, uh, there's language of him like either waking up or maybe coming out of sort of a daydream. Um, was that also intentional on your part? Uh, yeah, to a point. I mean, in the beginning, I wanted him to be absolutely certain what he saw, but he did smoke joint, a joint with, with, this, uh, with this sort of date from hell that he has in the very beginning, and he had an allergic reaction, unfortunately, and uh, there is this part where he cannot be sure because he does not actually remember clearly what it was. So I wanted him to become insecure of what he thought was black and white and uh, may not have been. So suddenly it's like, am I going crazy? Did I not see something the way I feel I did? Um, am I just making this a whole much, yeah, a whole lot bigger of an issue than it actually is? And then, you know, getting, uh, what's the word? Uh, getting the confirmation that he's not crazy, except it's way worse now because all of a sudden it looks like he might've had something to do with what went down, so. Right. Yeah. It might've been better if he had been a little bit crazy. <laughs> what was your initial inspiration for the story? Um, I always, I mean, I've read, I've been reading crime fiction my entire life um, from a very young age. Um, and I always loved books by Michael Connelly, um, Jeffrey Deaver. There's so many Miss Marple in the beginning with Agatha Christie when I was much younger. Um, and I was fascinated with these stories about crime and the passion and what people did to each other. But as I grew older, um, I sort of missed the, the gay component of it. Um, I, I had read books before by great authors like Michael Nava and Joseph Hansen, Armistead Maupin, and a lot of them feature crime elements or crime fiction. And uh, they had a protagonist that represented my life a bit more than perhaps uh, your, your Bosch novels and all that, even though I'm a huge fan of it. So I wanted to create a story that features a character that is closer to my experiences, but hopefully um, also entails all these elements, the, the, the suspense, the mystery, who did what to whom, and, uh, you know, the, the thriller elements of, of when it gets kind of dicey for Franco. And so that was basically the inspiration. Of course, I thought, oh, that's going to be super easy. I've read, <laughs> I read so many books, I've watched so many TV shows and movies. This is going to be a cinch. And uh, my first manuscript or the first go around was done fairly quickly. Um, it also was three times in length. <laughs> I quickly realized, yeah, okay, we have a problem. This needs to be narrowed down. There needs to be focus. I have people read it and come back to me and point out all the great things that they loved about the books and the characters or the book and the characters, but also the, um, the problems. And um, it took quite a while for me to educate myself better on writing, on what is done in crime fiction to actually get to the point where I had a book that was fairly cohesive. And uh, that took a few years, but I accomplished what I had set out to do to write a book that tells a story I would like to see and then hopefully <laughs> find people, readers, who also wanted to, same, the, the, wanted to see the same kind of story told. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, I can only imagine that, you know, you, you grow up, you read crime fiction, you're like, I could write this, but I, I can only imagine that once you start, you sit down and then you have to make sure that you have all the details correct. You know, there's a crime or a possible crime. And then how do you make all of the pieces fit together? How for you, did you keep track of all of your details? And did you, 
Are you an outliner? Um, what works best for you? When I started, I had these, I had the idea of what I wanted the story to be. And I have to say it also quite changed over the years. So originally it started outside of Studio 54 uh, because I love music and music plays a big part in the story as it does in my life. And so the whole story started right outside Studio 54 and there was this connection. But then over the years, as I kept editing and changing stuff, I realized it was not the ideal beginning and I needed to have the beginning that I currently do, which is a very isolated situation, which uh, makes it possibly even worse uh, for a four-year-old kid to see his dad die in front of him and then the lights go out and nobody be around. That is a lot scarier. So I, I changed things as I went along in editing, but I also did research and, and then found out that perhaps one thing was not quite like I described it if I wanted to be close to, let's say, reality, either where buildings were, where, you know, how the streets were, because I know New York fairly well, I'd say. I've made over 200 trips uh, to the city in my life, but I've never lived there. So there is a difference, again, between visiting and living there. But fortunately, I also have a lot of friends who live there and um, was able to draw from their memories, uh, either growing up or living there to give the book more of a, a reality factor. And um, that's basically how I went about it. Uh, it can, I constantly kept changing and evolving into what it is today. And I think it's a lot more grounded uh, as a result of it. It is time for our first break of the podcast. When we come back, Marco will be talking about the soundtrack of the book because even though it's not a movie, there is definitely a soundtrack. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I will be right back. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Marco Carocari about his debut novel, Blackout. Let's return to that interview. You mentioned music. Can you talk a little bit more about the constant soundtrack that is throughout <laughs> the book? Um, and the, the fact you, you even included a, a list at the end of the book of the music that you talk about. So we'll just talk yeah. about the music, please. <laughs> yes. So music's always been a major part of my life, um, especially in those times. I used to be a, very much of an introvert and I've changed a little. The, it's still there. I'm still more of an introvert than an extrovert today. Uh, if, if I'm in a room where I don't know people, I will be the one sort of standing in a corner watching my surroundings and, and, and you know, inching my way in rather than, boom, here I am, you know look at me. I've never been that person. So during times when I was a very, uh, much of an introvert and I didn't know exactly how to say certain things, music really came to my aid uh, because you had all these great bands and singers and, and songwriters. So that's always been a major part of my life. And um, I wanted that to be a part of Franco's life as well. I wanted him to find solace in music, but also joy and, and fun. And because he is working uh, part-time at one of his friends uh, nightclub you get to actually infuse a little bit more of that and the 70s and 80s have always held this uh, especially the 70s held a huge fascination um, in my life uh, from movies to books to to especially music and so there's a lot of that in there because there is a constant revival, which is really funny. A lot of people, you know, say disco sucks and disco's dead and all that stuff. And the funny thing is that a lot of artists during that time recorded music that sounded more disco or was more upbeat, but were actually R&B, jazz, you know, 
soul singers uh, had completely different careers. And then you had really great music come out of that late seventies time that's still relevant today. And people still cover today over and over. So clearly it left an impact and it gave me a chance to introduce a few titles that I like. And at the end, yes, there's a playlist just in case someone's interested. I created a playlist on uh, Spotify and um, YouTube even so that if people want to go and look that up or listen to the music, they can do that uh, and maybe discover a few artists that they didn't know about before. And I love that. It's a, it's above and beyond. Um, the book starts in 1977. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, there's a lot of references to music from the 70s and 80s. But then the cover also has a very early 80s vibe. Uh, in the acknowledgments, you said that your husband designed the cover. Did he, did you give him an idea of what you wanted? Or did he just kind of come up with the cover? <laughs> No, and I actually almost died over this. Um, <laughs> he was ready to kill me. So I had a lot of different ideas of what I wanted the cover to be. Originally, I looked at all my my go to authors that uh, whose books I read, and I saw what you know the big publishers did, uh, where you had uh, maybe a person, maybe it was just a shadowy person on the cover, and there was always this sort of danger. It was very thriller slash mystery sort of. Um, uh, directed. Uh, a lot of the books have similar covers to instantly give you a feel of what it is that you're going to get. And uh, we started that process and it didn't really work out. And so I went to my publisher, Level Best Book, and I said, um, we've had an idea and I want to run it by you. I want to show it to you. It's more graphic. It's more of a graphic um, art concept. But I finally said, so this book talks about two different times in life, which is uh, a retro time in the 70s and a present, you know, the current time that we're in, how can we combine this? And I went to Mark and I said, so this is what I'm looking at. This is what I think. I made a few sketches and then I uh, found samples of, of things that looked retro to me. And then he came up with uh, the final design. But at the time, I'd given him so many options. He he had to sit me down and say, so you need to take a chill pill. <laughs> I'm done with, with a million different ideas here. We have to kind of hone in on one thing and just do that because I actually have a job. I work for you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what came out of it. And I, I love it. I'm very happy with it. And I also love that we've gotten great feedback on it from everyone. And if you have a, a table full of books, it always kind of sticks out. And, and I like that uh, because as a, as a newbie and a nobody, you kind of have to, you have to grab people somehow. And uh, I, I, a lot of stuff that we, we do in life has to do with what we see, the visual. And so I'm hoping that, a, you know, it makes a few people pick up the book that might otherwise not and then read the back and say, oh, actually, this sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. So who knows? It, it definitely reminds me of my childhood and many, many T-shirts <laughs> um, <Yes>. from my <laughs> childhood. But I'm also just happy that uh, you are still married. <laughs> Your husband didn't <laughs> yes. believe you. And alive. Or, yeah, or smother you with a pillow or anything. <laughs> That's wonderful. True. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about Franco as the main character. What about him do you think will resonate with readers? I think and hope that his personal approach uh, will resonate with people. I wanted someone who, yes, has flaws, clearly, and is difficult at times, but I also didn't want to have someone who totally turns off people. Often in crime fiction, especially, you have these very difficult protagonists that are hard to like, and then you hope at some point they redeem themselves. And I wanted someone that's a little bit more normal, uh, someone who is at an interesting impasse in his life, in his 40s, who clearly didn't make it as a, like, he's busy as a photographer, sometimes, sometimes less, hence working two part-time jobs, but he lives in New York. It's expensive. He needs to make ends meet somehow. And he has a talent, but he also never really broke into mainstream. And at this point in his life, he does question, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I at? And then he gets thrown this massive curveball that answers questions he's had for most of his life. 
But with the answers, he has even more questions, not to mention suddenly his own life is in danger. So I wanted someone that is more relatable to most people as opposed to someone with you know superpowers someone who's already knowledgeable of, of of certain fields like in crime fiction often you have a homicide detective that solves the crimes etc i wanted him to be more of an amateur sleuth but also not fall into the agatha christie uh side of things where he's just kind of all of a sudden he feels like super equipped he's overwhelmed he doesn't know what to do and so he does what he can and then there is some aid from other sides that that finally get him to the conclusion but he also stumbles a lot which i think is normal if for any of us who are not equipped with um, all these talents or work for the law enforcement agencies you only have so many things to work with so that's sort of this the the outline the outset that i have for this for for his character mm -hmm. I yeah, I completely agree. Sometimes you read a novel and um, the main character stumbles across something and then they're just like, oh, yeah, I can solve this. No problem. And they jump in and they they're they're the amateur detectives, but they seem like they have a lot of more experience than they should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of character development, then when you started writing, did you have a pretty good idea about Marco's character, other characters um, or did they develop as you wrote them? How did that work for you? Uh, both. So funny, and it's funny that you called him Marco because exact that's exactly what happened to a lot of friends oh, of mine geez. in the beginning. I was reading no, your no, no. name on the Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in the very beginning, so the book originally was called Full Circle because I wanted things to come full circle for the character, um, for all the questions he's had. And over time, it changed to blackout because I thought it made more sense. But the character didn't have a name. And so I named him Marco. And uh, I, a lot of my friends were like, you need to change the character's name. You need to find a better name because it feels like we're reading about you. And, and there is like some information we don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and now we just associate you with this all the time. Oh, no. So, so I finally did uh, brainstorm. And the funny thing is, this was sort of a, not just a labor of love, but also a, a, a joint effort in the very beginning, because I went to my friends instantly. And I said, so I have an idea. I want to write a book. I want to finally try this. I've done this once in the past, many years ago, and it was super sucky. And now that I feel I know a lot more and, and have grown as a person, I would like to, I would like to try again. I'm not the naive 20 year old I was when I tried an earlier manuscript. I feel like I could possibly do this, but what I want to do is um, base or at least inspire some of the characters um, on my circle of friends. And that's what I did. And so my best friends are actually the best friends of Franco in a fictionalized version. In the beginning, I wrote them pretty much as they are. And then a few years in and doing rewrites, I realized these characters needed to be um, three-dimensional in their own right because they are not my friends. Uh, they are a, a fictionalized version. They all have different jobs in the book they all do what i imagine they would be doing if they weren't doing what they what they do in real life and so i uh, also needed to make sure that they fit the narrative uh what what franco's situation and franco's needs were and where they could um supply those needs or not and so they became a lot more their own I'd say in the last three years of rewriting and, and doing a few things and, and making certain characters more difficult in certain situation, uh, situations as opposed to constantly being his savior, which they were in the beginning. So I think it, and I, I think it worked because that's what I get a lot, uh, feedback from people who are like, I love the friends, I think they're great. Uh, everybody has a different voice, everybody has different strengths and uh, they really support Franco, but, they're also not the main characters. They, they, it's, it's Franco's stories, uh, uh, story. I always wanted it to be his journey. What happens to this person? Does he grow and how does he grow? And what does happen to him uh, throughout the book? How does he, does he find himself again after being thrown for a loop in such a massive way um, this late in life? Uh, so I, I, I hope it worked out. Uh, it's 
so far I've gotten really nice comments on that. So, so I'm hoping that worked, but it was fairly easy in the beginning because I had real people to base this on that mean a, a lot in my life uh, to me in my, the last 20 years that I've known these people. And I sort of wanted to pay homage to that as well to say, this is also a love letter to my friends as it is uh, to just hopefully crime fiction lovers. And what has been their response? Are they basically okay with their counterparts? Or? Yes, no, they are. They loved it in the beginning when I was really nice to them. And, uh, and then I finally sat them down a few years later and I said, just want to give you a heads up. I changed a few things because I felt it was uh, better for the story. And I've not heard complaints. In fact, actually, everybody's been um, most supportive. And they also realized that while these characters are inspired uh, by them that they are not themselves you know that they're not them and uh i've i've had wonderful feedback so i'm very happy yeah nobody's nobody's um uh, nullified any friendships so far so that's a good thing yeah, that's good that's good it's time for our second break of the podcast but that's an interesting question. If you had a friend or have a friend who is an author and that friend writes you in some way into a novel, how do you think, if, if it's happened to you, how did you feel about it? And if it hasn't happened to you, how do you think you would feel about it? I guess it would depend on the depiction, um, but I don't know if it would be interesting or terrifying to see how someone would write me as a character going to ponder that during the break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the research that Marco did for this novel. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Marco Carocari about his debut novel. The novel is called Blackout. Let's return to the interview. What types of research did you do for the book? Um, all sorts. I The funny thing is, as much as I've been to New York, when I started writing the book, I'd not been in four years. And by the time I finally got to visit after I'd written my first um, draft or second draft. Um, it was almost seven years between my last visit and current, and a lot had changed. And the great thing was that, yes, Google Maps was my friend, and I went and looked at a lot of stuff uh, that way as I was writing the book. But then when I had an opportunity to go back, and I've been back several times since, I actually had a chance to walk the streets and go where I say Franco lives and go to all the places where everything takes place. And I was able to make it that much more realistic because suddenly I was back in the time that I'm writing and I see the stuff that's around me and the things that have changed. And the, especially in certain areas where the stores, I remember the record stores or the mom, pa stores that were still there, let's say 10 years ago, um, made way for now, you know, for much newer boutiques and and newer stores that are opening up and, and all the construction that's constantly going on. It was, um, that helped a lot to finally get to see that again and not have to rely on, on maps. And then of course I did not live, I didn't grow up there. So I had to talk to friends who did, and I certainly didn't live through the seventies in New York. And, uh, fortunately there are a lot of documentaries on, uh, the times, 
of the late 70s, whether it's music or just uh, the state of the city, how, how it was in decline at the time, how uh, the blackout affected the neighborhoods. Uh, there is a lot of great stuff out there to watch today and sort of be reminded of, of what people do to each other and, uh, and how things looked. Uh, it was dirty. It was kind of, it was a totally different city than it is today. And that really helped a lot in, in making this more believable and making this more of a, a 3D experience as opposed to just a place you write about. Because if you whatever you choose as your setting, that's always a character in your book, whether it is a rural town or a city or a spaceship or whatever, you kind of need to be convincing when you talk about it. Otherwise, people are going to call you out on it. Did you start with wanting to set it in New York or did you think about, you know, having the blackout as part of the story? And so that kind of forced you to set it in New York. How was that decision made? Uh, no, I always wanted it to be New York because <laughs> so the interesting thing is there are, there are a lot of TV shows back home in Europe. And I'm talking some 10, 10, 15 years ago when I watched regular TV still. Um, and they started copying American shows. And so suddenly you had this German uh, cop drama that had exploding helicopters and, and car chases. And, uh, you know, it was like very action driven, like you would see in the States. And I watched it and I was like, this is such crap. That would never happen here. But you said it in America. It's believable because that's what we know, whether or not it actually happens. It's just been going on for so long. So New York has always fascinated me. And for better or worse, I truly believe anything can happen there. So uh, when I wrote the story, setting it in Zurich, which was suggestions that people had, friends of mine who were like, why aren't you setting it here in Zurich where you live at the time? I was like, no. I couldn't do this here. I don't think it would be believable. I don't think I have the tools to write this for this city. And I probably could have, but I wanted it to be more international. And so, yeah, New York was the place to go. And I still think that I will believe almost any story I read about New York or LA for that matter. Uh, whereas if, if you gave me something and it's a supposed to be taking place in Berlin or Frankfurt or, or Zurich or Bern or anything that's smaller, I'd be like, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I laugh and I roll my eyes a little bit, but you're not wrong. <laughs> you mentioned that you have read crime fiction pretty much your whole life. What about that genre do you think draws you to both reading it and writing in that genre? I just love mysteries uh, in general. The, the where and the why and the how, uh, there's, I don't think I could ever write something that was specifically on forensics, um, although I find it fascinating to watch and also to read. But I, I do find it fascinating what we as people are capable of, whether that is good or bad. It doesn't have to be a mystery, but uh, we, we constantly surprise ourselves and each other by by doing things that are unlike our nature the way you know we see ourselves or others have seen ourselves and um it's just always been fun to me of course as i said earlier i used to read um a lot of agatha christie when i was younger and they were not particularly brutal. Uh, so they're not all that graphic. And then, of course, I grew up watching Margaret Rutherford as Miss Marple, which is, of course, nothing like Miss Marple in the books, but was the incarnation for me that uh, I, I wanted all the books to be exactly like that because I, I think she's an amazing actress and was phenomenal in the, in the movies. So as it progressed, my choice of books got more more sinister and bloodier and um it, again it just it, it always kept my fascination to this day um maybe i'm a little morbid i don't know it's possible that my mind got a little twisted but i do find it fascinating it's also scary of course especially when you realize that a lot of these books uh, are based on real cases and now that i uh, have done many years of my own research for my own stories often i do find an inspiration in something that actually happened. And while that might be 
how to say this, uh, you, you might think, oh, what a great idea. But then you sit down and you look at this and you're like, how horrible is this? This actually happened. Someone did this to someone. Why? And then suddenly, again, there's this interest. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And you follow the case. You try to find out how a person who was perceived as one th- one kind of person or thing uh, turns into something completely different. Who pushed their buttons and why? And, and what was it that made them go over the brink? That's what fascinates me. Although I also have to say this year was really hard for me. Uh, I had a lot of ups and downs in my head with self-doubt and all that sort of stuff, as a lot of people do. I guess it's partially the pandemic and partially it's it's always been in my in my life, um, depression and anxiety as it is for many other people. So this year was particularly bad, which was ironic since so many things went well for me this year. Um, but it made it harder to write and it made it kind of harder to settle on a particular project, uh, even though I have at least five <laughs> that I could just jump in um, right away. And it kind of made me step back and look at everything and and wonder if um, if crime fiction and writing crime fiction and my fascination with it might be a part of the problem where you know your your outlook is negative or your outlook is less positive at the very least as opposed to writing i don't know a children's books story or or try humor or romance or something else it's a dark topic definitely and if you spend a lot of time in it and you start doing research with uh um, true crime and and uh non-fiction it's eye-opening, it's fascinating, but it's also very sad on many levels and, and, and horrific. So it definitely informs, I guess, anybody's writer's um, work. And um, it, it, But it can throw you for a loop every now and again. I can imagine that it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it, it can be maybe cathartic in some ways is to sort of delve into that darker part of the psyche. But at the same time, you can get lost in the internet searches and go down rabbit holes and um, go to some yeah. pretty unhealthy places. Yes, absolutely. I, I imagine your, your internet history, like many authors would be <laughs> questionable for people. <laughs> At best, I actually, before I became a green card holder, I was really worried about this because, I mean, I look up some, I look up some stuff, you know, yeah. crime fiction where you like, and then suddenly, you know, that you're going through interviews and you have to, you have to make sure that they don't suddenly have red flags. So I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder if anybody's ever going to go like, we want to see your internet, uh, your internet browser your <laughs> right. history right. and then be like, you know, here is a return ticket. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the door hit you. Uh, yeah. Exactly. But I have to say that wherever I go, especially if I have an opportunity to talk to police, I always make sure they know who I am, where, I, where I'm from, that they have pretty much everything. So they're like, OK, nobody would be that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that you have several projects that you could jump into um, when you're when you're back in that mindset. Do you think that you would return to Franco as a character or this world in particular? I do. And it's interesting. Um, when I signed up with Level Best Books, they were really wonderful. They loved the book and they said, oh, would you be interested in a three book deal? And um, I actually turned it down and opted for a one book deal. And I'm still very happy to, to be with them. But I... I did that simply because I had no idea what to expect. This is my first book. I'm exceptionally fortunate to be able to publish my first book as my first book. Uh, So many people, like just last night, somebody said, how many books did you write before this one got published? And I said, yeah, I'm ashamed to say almost, but it is my first. And I was was lucky. I was fortunate that someone liked it and went with it. And the problem I had in the beginning was I, I always, you know, imposter syndrome is always a big topic uh, in my world. And can I do this again? And the idea of having sort of that sort of your head where you are required to deliver a book each year, uh, I just didn't feel comfortable with that. And I said, I, I'd rather just try this on a one-off. Obviously, I want to write more books. I want to publish more books. 
but uh, they were very open and very generous. And so that was fantastic because I wanted to make sure this book actually works, that it doesn't tank, that people don't rip it apart and call me the worst thing since whatever. And um, I have been, again, very fortunate that the book has been very well received. The reviews are great. Um, people have been really wonderful. The exposure has been been wonderful and i i count myself very very lucky so now i feel a lot better about returning to that uh that storyline because i always had more ideas but i also did not want it to necessarily be a series i'm perfectly okay if this is a one-off and we never see franco again as much as i love him and the characters because i told the story i do have a second story that is sort of a follow-up because i put a lot of people through a lot of crap in that book and it will leave at least two three of the characters changed by the end of the book there are repercussions to everything they did and there is a very natural progression into another book and some threads that are tied up that um like in real life can be untied again or at least made loose so that there are more questions there are things that need to be explored but i wanted the book to have a an ending i want a blackout to have an ending and not just kind of leave it open-ended completely i wanted there to be closure for the characters but as I said, a lot of stuff happened and that continues. So it'd be great to go back. I do have the story in my head, but it is more of a 50-50 where the uh, police procedural would take a lot more uh, of the front seat than it did in the last one. And I, uh, I want to make sure that I'm really, I know what I'm writing about. That's always hard to research these things and find the right sources to talk to you, to help you make your books believable and, and factual, as opposed to just, oh, this is what needs to happen. And now we're going to bend all the rules. Uh, I want the books to be, to, to contain more accuracy going forward um, as much as I can, so that people who are used to reading books like that don't have to say oh we'll forgive him or her for that uh will you know it's it's their first or second book uh, i want them to be like no they they wrote like they know what they're talking about and um and we felt comfortable in that book and that story and the genre time for our last break of this podcast so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Marco Carocari. As a refresher before the break, Marco was talking about uh, whether or not he might return to this world, to Franco as a character. Just wanted to remind you of that because where I where I split this to do the commercial, um, I'm, I'm kind of jumping into the, what sounds like the middle of a conversation. So just a reminder so you remember where we were at um, before the break. I completely agree with your assessment. I mean, obviously you wrote it, so you know what you're talking about, but um, it, it <laughs> I, when I finished it, I thought, yeah, that could be a standalone, but I feel like there's room. We could definitely go back <laughs> to this world. So yeah. Yeah. And people are asking, that's a great thing. I have a lot of people asking and say, when's the sequel coming? And I love that I have the idea that I'm not completely in the woods. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, uh, do I have the chops to do the police procedural part justice? And I'm a, a, an eternal doubter. Uh, that's that's certainly not helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I do miss the the um, 
what we call a blue-eyed approach, uh, the naive approach where you think, oh, sure, I can do this. I, I, I kind of miss that part of me because that's kind of gone now with everything I've learned. I was very naive when I started the book, but it was so much fun. And I wrote day and night. I would wake up in the middle at two, uh, middle of the night at two o'clock and I have this idea and suddenly it'd be five in the morning and I was still working and I had three hours to get to my job. Um, I love that when that happened. And that was the case about the, maybe about the first year of rights and rewrites. And then I took all these classes. I learned more. I realized what you needed to watch out for, what you should avoid. And that made me a lot more um, hesitant and certainly a lot less um, spontaneous. So right now, when I start writing a book, there are already a million what ifs and questions that are blocking me rather than just propelling me forward, which is a little unfortunate. So um, yeah, the sequels in my head, uh, but I also have uh, three other ideas that I um, excited about and have I'm in, in various stages of, of um, realizing the concept. One is an LAPD um, mystery slash thriller, which is all police procedural. Which again, <laughs> I need to need to know a lot to make sure that that really flies. Because I think I got the story. You just want to make sure that you don't screw up on on uh, forensics and all that stuff. And then there is a, an idea for Palm Springs because I haven't seen that yet. So I, I like to I'd like to try my hand at a different mystery story that that set in Palm Springs, and I had a dream a few weeks ago, and that's never happened in my entire life ever. I had a dream, and I woke up, and I thought that could actually be a story, and I sat down, I wrote the outline, and um, I told it to a few people, and everybody was like, "That sounds like a great idea." So. I just need to find the mojo to, <laughs> to actually um, execute this idea, but I'm happy that they're there. It's mm -hmm. not like uh, just dial tone, you know, and you're waiting and there's nothing happening. So it's a good thing. I, I completely understand that, you know, you've that once, once you've done something and then you're going to do it a second time, you, you know what the hurdles are, you know what the obstacles are and the challenges. And you're like, yeah, I've done this already. I'm not sure I'm ready to jump back into that. Yeah. From absolutely. your own from your own experience then do you have advice for other people who might want to write? Um well it's not I would say the same to everyone which is basically not news don't give up. Uh it took me 8 years to get to a publication and I've had ups and downs and I had major doubts. I so often thought, okay, I tried this, it didn't work out. Just, you know, it was a cute attempt, but why bother? Why waste more time? And it never let me go. The, the, the manuscript never let me go. I always felt like, no, there's, there, I've invested too much time in this. There, this. I believe in this. This has to go somewhere. And it definitely helps to educate yourself, take classes, find other people who write, but also more than not writing your own genre. Uh, if in, even if it's general non uh, crime fiction and perhaps not psychological or not suspense or not romance, because crime fiction is its own beast. And a lot of people in crime fiction understand better what you're going through than someone who writes perhaps strictly romance or, or, or strictly sci-fi. Um, certain elements are the same, but I do love going to these mystery conferences, the conventions that take place all over the States, you find a lot of like-minded people that can open your eyes uh, and, and be of great support to you because they are a very, very welcoming bunch, as twisted as our minds are and as horrible the things we do to our protagonists in our books. Um, I've rarely met a more loving and supportive group of people than people who kill on the pages. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I never heard it quite. No, I've heard it put that way. I just, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting club to be in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. You've talked about some of your favorite authors, people that you've, you've read over the years. Um, what have you, have you been doing much reading lately? What, what have you been reading more recently? 
Yeah, well, that's the good thing. If you're if if there is this thing that some call writer's block, I, I don't know what it was. I think it was a timeout for me, but I did read a lot of books this year by a lot of authors that I had not read before or that I had and hadn't read anything new by in a while. Um, there are some wonderful authors out there. And uh, that's another thing when you join all these um, crime fiction conventions and uh, mystery chapters, you meet a lot of really talented people, some of which have maybe not gotten uh, the same kind of fame as some others. And they're just as wonderful writers. Um, this year, my favorite author definitely is uh, Sean Cosby. I loved Blacktop Wasteland and Razorblade Tears. They were fantastic. And My Darkest Prayer, uh, Prayers, which was also a really great book. Uh, and it's, all, it's still kind of buying for, for first spot. I really loved it because it was had a lot of black humor in it dark humor whatever and um but i have my go-to's like michael connelly john connelly um this year i read a great debut by emilia neymark i hope i don't screw up that name it's called hide in place i really like that a lot oh i'm excited she's gonna be on the podcast so oh yeah no 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 i i, Good. I love her i she, we talk on on facebook uh, a lot because we're in a few of the same groups uh that was a great book i really enjoyed that a lot uh, and some very interesting choices that she made that really worked for me. So your readers will have a great time listening to that one. Um, I love Rachel Hauselhall's Lou Norton LAPD series. She has a few standalones that I'm now getting through, but uh, I love the way she writes. She's got some great stuff. Kelly Garrett uh, had a series out that was the uh, Detective by Day series. And they're really funny. They're mm -hmm. more cozies, uh, which is generally not necessarily what I read. My books, the, the, my go-tos are more bloody or my, more psychological. But I'm so glad I read those books. They were so much fun to read. Uh, she's, she's a very funny lady. And she has a new book coming out called Like a Sister. In March, and very yeah. Yes, and I'm very excited to, to get my hands on that at some point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's just so many talented people. Gabriel Valjean is uh, another author I really love. Um, and he's with the same publisher as I am. He's also a wonderful person to know in general for any aspiring writer, especially in the crime fiction field. There are few people who do as much for the crime fiction community as, as he does by constantly boosting people and tweeting and, and sharing stuff on Facebook. Uh, and he is a really talented writer. He has three different series out. Uh, one is set in uh, Italy. Uh, it's called the Roma series. Then he has the company files that take place mostly in the America 1950s, 60s. And uh, my favorite is the Jean Cleary mysteries that are set in a very grimy, gritty 70s Boston. And his new book is Hush Hush, and that's coming out in January. And I had a chance to not only be a, uh, a, a advanced reader, I even got to do a blurb, which was so amazing because it's, it's a wonderful book. So a lot of great people out there that... Uh, yeah, are, are just so talented and it's wonderful to be accepted by that group that they are, you know, like, oh, sure, you know, come on, join us. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps to, you know, to go and read as many uh, people out there that you can, even if it's not in your typical genre. I, I found a lot of books that I truly enjoyed that I would have never picked up had someone else not recommended it to me or said, this is a person you need to watch. And um, that's that's one of the great things about the community. They're always trying to raise each other up and, and help each other. And that way you find some wonderful authors that you might have not known about before and suddenly have the privilege of reading their book. I think publishing is getting a lot more diverse and better at um, representation. I think people are finding themselves on the page more now than in the past, but uh, for people who are looking to uh, expand their the diversity of their reading, do you have go-to authors or books that are um, in, in the LGBTQ plus arena that you would recommend? Yes, absolutely. Um, I read a few authors this year that uh, have wonderful books out. The, the first one is By Way of Sorrow uh, by Robin Geigel, and it features a transgender character, um, which is really terrific. The other uh, transgender writer that I discovered um, last year is Dharma Keller, 
who has uh, quite a few books out, uh, different series, and they're really amazing as well. I love those. I always like um, anything that Michael Nava writes. He's one of my favorite authors, has been for a long, long time. Also a wonderful person to know. Um, Philip Vernon wrote um, Bathhouse this year, although I hardly need to introduce that one because <laughs> it's got huge fanfare everywhere, uh, deservedly so. He was um, he was on pretty much everybody's list this year. But uh, for those who don't know yet, um, P.J. Vernon, Philip Vernon, Bathhouse was a huge success this year. Uh, probably the biggest LGBTQ book um, to hit the market in a long, long time. Uh, just the way it was promoted and the way it was received uh, it's it's done really well from what I from what I hear he's a wonderful person as well uh, been very helpful to me personally also by uh, agreeing to read my book and blurbing it uh, when we really did actually not know each other at all so as again um, as I said earlier a lot of wonderful people out there who see what you're doing and how you're trying to succeed and they will give you a lending hand uh, lend a hand and say sure you know I'll, I'll take the time to read your book or I'll, I'll take the time to boost your tweets and, and, and help raise awareness because it's always tough for any writer. And especially if you're in any shape, way or form, a minority writer, it's always harder to be heard to, it's always harder to find the right publisher because ultimately publishers want to make money. Uh, there are some people who do stuff out of the goodness of their heart, but it's a business and um, not everybody is going to take a risk on someone who might be writing for a minority, again, whatever that might be. And you saw that when, you know, the LGBTQ had a huge heyday in the 80s and 90s, but then all that went away and most of the big publishers and smaller publishers dropped their authors because they couldn't make enough money. And it's sort of getting a revival right now. Uh, there are a lot of LGBTQ writers who get um, contracts, who get their books out, who get great promotions with it. Um, and, and that goes for other minority writers as well, whether you're uh, a woman or, or a person of color, or you check all the boxes of the above, uh, the, the more diverse you are and the, the more diverse your characters, sometimes the more problematic it is for you to find someone to roll with you and say, hey, this is an awesome book. We're gonna publish this regardless because we believe in you. And it's wonderful to see that things are changing. I only hope it sticks because again, I saw what happened to the to all the gay and lesbian writers in the 80s and 90s. They went away for quite a while and sort of uh, were just in a particular niche and it was hard to find them. I hope that this current uh, waking of, of trying to include people is not just a thing of uh, the latest trends and recent years, but that we will continue to do this because there are just so many wonderful writers out there that you haven't heard of simply because they weren't given the chance, not because their books aren't good. They are. They mm -hmm. just needed to have that person uh, root for them and say, let's go with you. Mm -hmm. I think the rise of um, self-publishing is helping that as well. Yes. Yeah. True. All right. Internet presence, uh, website, social media, where can people find you? I'm a little all over. Um, Marco Karakari is my name, and if you type that in, you will probably find my website, which is marcokarakari.com. Um, same thing on Facebook, same thing on Instagram and Twitter. My accounts are usually quite open so that anybody can find me, so it's fairly easy. I'm, I'm not the most social uh, media person in the sense that I will not tweet and, and, and post stuff every day or several times a day. Sometimes there's a week or two of nothing, but I always love interacting with people. And I especially love that I had several people reach out to me, complete strangers who um, complimented me on the book or, or, or yeah, just wanted to cheer me along, which was, um, just so unexpected and wonderful. That's that's always a great thing when people reach out to you to say that somehow you touched them and made a difference. That's that's awesome. That is awesome. And we have talked about a variety of different things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you were hoping to highlight during our time together? Uh, no, um, I think we're good. I think as far as the book and myself are concerned, uh, I think people get got a pretty 
a pretty good glimpse of what what it is, and hopefully it uh, it turned a few people on to checking it out, going to see what the book is all about, and maybe they want to read it. So that would be fantastic, of course. Wonderful. Well, Marco, thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend to talk to me. I really, really appreciate it. No, thank you, Sarah. I always appreciate anyone making time for me and giving me a chance to talk about myself or the book. Um, Thank you so much for, for giving authors like myself a chance. Thank you so much once again to Marco for joining me to talk about Blackout and so many other topics. If you are a fan of crime fiction, if you're a fan of suspense, um, if you are looking for a book that has a lot of really interesting um, music that you might want to check out, then you should definitely look into Blackout. Uh, You won't miss it because the cover, as Marco was talking about, is it stands out right now. It does not look like a lot of other books that are on the shelves. And you're going to recognize if you're a child of the 80s or a child of the 70s and 80s, you are going to recognize this color scheme on the front of Blackout. If you are looking to maybe diversify your reading and you're looking to read something with a, a main character who is LGBTQ+, plus, this would be a great one to read as well as so many others that are out there and Marco mentioned a few of those but there are a lot of really good reasons to read Blackout. A, you get a a protagonist who is 43, not your typical age for a protagonist. You know, we often get I don't know, 28 seems to be the magical age for female protagonists, <laughs> mid-30s for, for men. So you get someone who's a little older, someone who is gay, someone who is just maybe not your typical protagonist. And so uh, for me, that's always exciting when I get to read someone who doesn't look like every other protagonist in the books that I read. So Blackout, definitely check this one out. So thank you again to Marco. Thank you as always to you, my listeners. I hope that you will join me for the next um, interview, which uh, unless something needs to be rescheduled, will be with author David Mucci. I hope I'm saying that right. I'll find out when I interview him, M-U-C-C-I. His book is called uh, Ignatius and the Swords of Nostal. It is Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right either, but I'll find out. N-O-S-T-A-W. It's fantasy. And I'm looking forward to speaking with David. So join me for that interview. In the meantime, if you have not done so already, if you would please leave a review, whether starred or written, of this podcast, I would be greatly, greatly appreciative of that. It'd be a wonderful Christmas present in, in case you... We're sitting around thinking what to get your favorite podcaster. I'm not saying I'm your favorite podcaster, but what to get your favorite podcaster, give their podcast a review. Uh, Also, if you're not following on social media, you should do that as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from listeners. So hit me up with your holiday plans, your holiday reading, whatever random thought crosses your mind. I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that your Christmas week is going really well so far. Hope that you're going to get to spend time with family, friends, loved ones, whomever you are going to spend time with this week. I hope that it is just a wonderful experience and you have a really great week. And hopefully you've got some extra time off work and you can use that extra time to maybe get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program